Hello, I'm Judy Garber. I'm the Chief of Cancer Genetics and Prevention at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. And I've been asked to talk today about cancer risk screening and prevention for people with BRCA1 or BRCA2 pathogenic variants instead of mutations. And I'm thrilled to be part of the FORCE conference again this year. So my disclosures, um, I do get some funding from Helix Genetics, not much. Uh, I don't get it from others. My husband gets some from Novartis and otherwise these are research collaborations. So we all are familiar with pedigrees, family histories of BRCA1 and 2 carriers uh, typically. Um, these are, um, so here we have a family with a woman with breast cancer at a young age, breast and ovarian cancer, multiple generations on the father's side, uh, which we all know is still possible for BRCA1 and 2. Mom had breast cancer, there could be something genetic over here, it just seems less likely. We know now that um, we have different criteria for testing, guidelines for testing, who we should test. It used to be all about family history. Now the NCCN, the, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network that sets guidelines often in the US um, has said instead we should be looking for people with a mutation in the family, duh, um, and cancers where treatment could be affected by knowing that there's a mutation or a pathogenic variant underneath. So ovarian cancer for sure, pancreas cancer, advanced prostate cancer. People of Jewish descent um, can be tested with even less family history or less worry. If there has been a tumor tested looking for a treatment strategy, you might find an, an alteration in BRCA1 or 2. It could be originating in the tumor only and not inherited, but most of the time it will be found in uh, the blood cells or saliva of people. So they need to be tested to determine whether this is an acquired variant or something you were born with. And then any of the many models used to estimate the chance of having a, a susceptibility gene that's greater than 5%, and that's why 5%, uh, that's the number, um, that should generally be covered by insurance. For people with breast cancer, we're still using some family history issues, so or age of diagnosis, people diagnosed at an unusually young age, triple negative breast cancer, Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry again, family history of any of the tumors we just talked about, uh, particularly in close relatives, but some people have small families, and there has now been data to suggest that people just being Jewish have a 2.5% chance of carrying a BRCA1 or 2 specific mutation, and that they can be tested for those with no other uh, family or personal cancer history. And then, of course, we said that anything that would uh, lead to treatment with a particular drug targeting the BRCA1 or 2 pathways these PARP inhibitors we'll talk about more, um, those people should also be tested. So all advanced breast cancer is tested because it would affect a treatment decision. Now, how much breast cancer risk is there? So for the last 30 years, women and men who with uh, BRCA1 and 2 mutations have generously contributed their data to large uh, projects. And it is only because of that that we know today what we know that is hopefully benefiting them and their family members. So from these data from the Simba cohort, uh, so-called, you can see very high risk of uh, breast cancer in BRCA1 and 2, lifetime risk almost 70% in this estimate. Here, BRCA1 ovarian cancer risk more than 40%, BRCA2 between 15 and 20%. Um, now there are data from a large cohort that's less selected. So when people have been in the previous studies, it's because they were tested early, they were known to have a mutation, they had a family history usually that drove them to testing. It makes you worry that you're overestimating the risk a little bit. Um, and possibly that risk number applies to people who, whose life situation is described by that, having more family history. But for people with less or smaller families, this is from the Carrier Study published in the New England Journal this year, 49,000 women in a breast cancer uh, case control study, so with breast cancer controls, without breast cancer, estimating from among those 41,000 people with mutations in all these different genes for BRCA1 and 2, clearly much more breast cancer um, and much more mutation in people with breast cancer than uh, mutations in people without breast cancer. That helps you estimate risk, and you can see that it's much higher seven and a half times as 
high risk of breast cancer uh, in BRCA1, five and a quarter in BRCA2, highly statistically significant. Uh, this study probably gave the most important information to, that you'll hear about again from Dr. Curian for these other genes, but still stabilizes the risk of BRCA1 and 2, helps you be more confident about what those risk numbers are. They're less biased because they've come from a general population. The studies, uh, this is from this, the same ed edition of the New England Journal, another large study over 100,000 women um, with looking at many different genes here asking, does it matter by, can by breast cancer type, those that are driven by hormones, those that are not driven by hormones? And you can see that for BRCA1, I hope you can see that the triple negative so-called or ER negative tumors predominate. That's mostly what women get with a BRCA1 mutation, maybe 70%, whereas for BRCA2, it's more ER positive. There are still um, BRCA1 related ER positive tumors and vice versa, so we don't usually only check women if they have um, a triple negative breast cancer for BRCA1. We test for everything because you're not sure what you will find and some of these other genes play a role as well. This is just showing that BRCA1 and 2 still have the highest breast cancer risk, but there are substantial risks from PALB2, for example, and more moderate risks from these other genes, but they are still greater than the general population. Um, this is just, I guess, displayed another way. What's for some of these genes, there's increased risk, but the, the risk is predominantly triple negative breast cancer risk. And that's important because those tumors are the ones that will require chemotherapy. Um, other tumors may or may not need chemotherapy as part of their treatment. And that can make these tumors more important to avoid for women who are looking to try and reduce their breast cancer risk. And one of the most important things for the future are these polygenic risk scores. So this is looking at our genetics, not by the single gene BRCA1 or BRCA2, but looking at a lot of other genes that might modify the risk associated with the BRCA1 or 2 um, variant. And this is asking how much does your other in inherited modification of hormones or carcinogens or some other factors affect your risk. It makes sense that it would. We know that within families, not everybody gets the same tumor at the same age. And certainly between families, these things can differ sometimes by behaviors or lifestyle factors. But these data suggest that also by uh, genetics. And we hope that these will help us be more specific about an individual's risk uh, so that they can use that information to better plan their own risk reduction strategies. Um, men with um, prostate cancer, uh, lots of BRCA2 risk, some BRCA1, CHECK2, and ATM as less powerful genes. So a lot of BRCA2, I don't think the men were quite prepared for this when it was found. Um, and there is clearly more risk of prostate cancer in mutation carriers compared to men uh, with the general population. Um, and that is why it's showing that this risk begins to really take off around 50. The recommendation for uh, BRCA1 or 2 variant carriers is that they begin screening at 40. Here are the data for pancreas cancer. So you do get the feeling that almost all cancers have an inherited component, that's certainly true. These are the four cancers that are most commonly associated with BRCA1 and 2. You can see from several studies, plenty of BRCA1 and 2 among the inherited um, predisposition. This is the Dana-Farber series here from Dr. Yergelin. And here, just reminding you that you can have a family that looks like a a breast cancer family, I'm not sure what this Hodgkin's disease is doing here, but then pancreatic cancer in two family members. And certainly people are right to be very worried about pancreas cancer. It is something um, that is difficult to detect early and uh, rarely curable. Um, but uh, the risk of pancreas cancer in BRCA1, you can see is no more than about 5%, which is close to the population risk. Um, in BRCA2, in this series, it was clearly higher um, than the population risk. Um, we'll talk about pancreas screening a little more. What do we do for people who have um, BRCA1 or 2 pathogenic variants? Really, for all of the genes, you can decide not to pass them on. There is technology for that, um, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or pre-implantation testing. Um, this is part of where women who are pregnant uh, may undergo stimulation of the ovaries. An egg is harvested. It is fertilized by the sperm grown up here to about eight cells. And then one of those cells is taken away and tested to see if the known BRCA1 or 2 variant in the family is present. 
Um, if it is, that embryo is known to carry it. There will be positive and negative embryos. You can choose to reimplant the negatives into the parent, but sometimes that's not an option or that's not all you get. Anyway, the technology exists and people can use it to try and plan their families if that is their desire. This is obviously highly uh, individualized. There are many reasons why people would or would not pursue this technology. Now, what do we do about pancreatic cancer risk? So uh, this is just saying, so the screening is endoscopic ultrasound or MRIs of the pancreas or MRI, MRCPO, way of looking in the pancreatic duct uh, under MRI guidance. So of course, we all in theory would like to be screened to find our cancers early if they're going to occur. Um, but the problem is that, uh, that this is not so black and white, that there are limitations, there is cost, although insurance usually does cover this. You can find a lot of benign findings, but you can't always go biopsy them because it's the pancreas, which is not easy to biopsy. It's just sort of a bag of enzymes that if they leak could be quite damaging. And there is not data to show that people live longer who, are, um, who have uh, pancreas screening, but that they do have smaller tumors. So one can hope that they will do better. That's not really been proved. And because it hasn't, some people find that being monitored all the time is a burden rather than a benefit. And that's something, that's why they encourage discussion, uh, not just recommendation. For BRCA1 and 2, the guidelines recommend screening if you do it to begin at 50, but they also recommend that you do it only if a first or second degree relative has had pancreas cancer. So it's not enough to have the BRCA1 or 2 mutation alone. You need to have a family member with pancreas cancer to suggest that perhaps your family's risk is higher. Maybe those modifier genes have been at work um, and that therefore it may be worth having screening. Now, this is not a perfect method, and therefore, we'll need more research to help sort out just who gets pancreas cancer in these families and who uh, should be having this pancreas cancer screening. Unfortunately, although you can do prophylactic pancreatectomies, remove the pancreas, that is generally reserved for people who have syndromes where the pancreas cancer risk is higher than BRCA1 and 2. What about prostate cancer? So what do men do? They have digital rectal exams by their physicians and serum PSA, that's a typographical error, should be an A. Here, beginning at 40 for BRCA1 and 2 carriers, beginning at 50 in the general population. So the guidelines recommends prostate cancer screening for BRCA2 because you showed how common BRCA2 mutations were in prostate cancer and only consider in BRCA1, sorry about this typo, because the risks are so much lower uh, for prostate cancer in BRCA1 carriers. What about breast cancer management? So uh, they start young. They want people to be aware they have breasts. I'm sure they are by 18 to have clinical breast exams beginning at 25 every six to 12 months. That means by a healthcare professional. Screening then with breast MRI annually um, starting at 25 until 30. That is no mammograms during that time because of concern of protecting the tissue from the carcinogenic effects of radiation, which are weak but present. Um, between 30 and 75, annual mammogram, annual breast MRI, usually alternating every six months, but some people prefer to have them together. And then over 75 individualized, again, presumably based on family history, whether there are people with late effects or other reasons that might increase their breast cancer risk over and above BRCA1 and 2. Um, there is a paper I know coming that will help clarify this. I'm hoping that we'll be able to stop getting MRIs on women at some point. There are cumulative toxicities one would like to avoid. Now, the guidelines have always said to discuss risk-reducing mastectomies and to consider in this discussion how much protection do women get from the surgery. So not 100%, uh, but 90 plus percent, it's still the most effective way of reducing risk but it is not 100%, and some women will find that a reason not to pursue surgery at whatever time in their lives. Options for reconstruction, certainly risks of the procedure. These are generally safe procedures done by experts, but there's always a complication potential, the risk of, of uh, problems with the flaps or problems with the implants. Um, at least these things should be discussed. And including the psychosocial and quality of life effects 
of having risk-reducing mastectomies. Now, there are plenty of data that women who have the surgery for themselves, who have come to the decision on their own, sometimes with help from a healthcare professional, a psychologist, a social worker, other women, um, that as long as they do this because they are ready, they're um, very likely to have few regrets um, down the road, uh, generally to be relieved. That is not true necessarily if women are doing this to please someone else, and we all have to be careful about this. But um, the important point is that this is an option. It should be discussed, and at a time in life when women might feel it is the right thing to do, they should do it. Some women will certainly not choose to do this, and there's a reason for that. Um, Oops, sorry. One of the reasons is that risk-reducing mastectomies, contrary to all expectations, do not prolong survival. These are very good data from the Dutch and from other groups of uh, showing this to be true. You would think that it would be. It suggests that screening works, that you can find early breast cancers and cure them. But many women would prefer life without breast cancer in it, either from the diagnosis moment or the management issues, treatment, chemotherapy or hormone therapy or both. Um, so it's great that you can be cured, but many women would prefer to avoid that. Other women would rather take a chance um, and be followed closely, knowing that if something is found, it is likely to be small and they will be cured and that it may never occur. Um, these are very individual decisions and people change how they feel about these issues over a lifetime. For male breast cancer, the recommendation are for self-exam, um, for clinical breast exams beginning at 35, mammograms for men who have extra breast tissue, um, beginning for them uh, either at 50 or if there was early male breast cancer in the family. Um, again, this is an uncommon occurrence in BRCA1 and 2. So I thank Freya Schnabel for sharing her slides with me about prophylactic mastectomy. Um, people have considered this topic in great detail, trying to make it um, a realistic, uh, acceptable, clinically acceptable, cosmetically acceptable option for women who choose to have it, but also to prove whether the benefit is there or not, so that women who don't want to have risk-reducing mastectomies never feel that they must do that. So here's a cost-effectiveness analysis, which it looks like I took part of it out, but basically showing that, um, that you certainly will reduce risk with surgery, that is good, but if you compare it to screening, for many women, it will never, um, it will never be the preferred option. Risk-reducing mastectomies generally have in the past included removal of the nipple, but now there have been several studies to show that the nipple can be retained safely, that there are not cancers occurring in the nipple, behind the nipple or area um, in follow-up that now is getting to be quite substantial follow-up, and that this is a very careful set of studies by a group of surgeons here, uh, Dr. Wiley's group at Georgetown and Boston, Dr. Smith's group, um, have really established that if carefully done and tissue is removed from behind the nipple, that this can be a safe risk-reducing procedure. Um, it does give a superior cosmetic result. It does mean that the nipple areola will not have feeling and will not be able to stand up. Um, but, um, and there have been somewhat more wound complications and some people's bodies, the nipple will not end up in the right place. So this is worth an important conversation between a woman and her reconstructive surgeon and breast surgeon. Um, these are just examples of women, and you can see these are not, um, these are, are women with all body types who have had um, what hopefully most of them would consider successful. These are Dr. Schnabel's patients with their permission. What about ovarian cancer? So here, reducing risk um, by removing this tube, salpingo, oophorectomy, the tubes and the ovaries between 35 and 40, in, uh, certainly in, in BRCA1 carriers, in BRCA2, one can delay. Uh, because the risk of ovarian cancer is less, as you know, unless family history of earlier onset ovarian cancers would compel you otherwise. Removing the tubes alone and delaying oophorectomy is not the standard of care. It's appealing um, surgically. It's appealing for women not to have early menopause, but it is not proven to work. Um, and the other thing that has complicated the discussion has been uh, whether a hysterectomy should be performed as part of the surgery instead of just the tubes and ovaries, particularly in BRCA1 carriers. We're going to talk about that a little more. I should mention that the NCCN mentions here that screening has not been proven to be of benefit, and therefore screening with transvaginal ultrasounds and CA125s regularly is considered optional um, at the, at the clinician's 
discretion, that means the patient and the clinician, of course, uh, starting in the 30s. What else do we know? Well, we know uh, that people have tried to figure out if there's any reduced fertility in women, particularly with BRCA1 mutations measuring AMH levels. Uh, there's a suggestion that this is true. So we sometimes tell patients who have women who have a BRCA1 variant that they might not want to delay childbirth as long as they might for other social reasons, just in case this is correct and their fertility is slightly compromised. Here's data uh, asking, can you remove the ovaries and reduce breast cancer risk? So in BRCA2, absolutely. This is a huge effect, an 83% reduction by premenopausal removal of the ovaries, but not for BRCA1. This used to be thought to be true, but it turned out to be a problem across several studies. BRCA1 tumors, we remember, are not hormone driven. So it's not that surprising that removing the ovaries would not reduce their um, breast cancer risk. Um, but it was nonetheless not true in the past. That has been recognized now. What about hormone replacement um, in women after they have their ovaries removed? So here are the data for all hormone replacement. That's estrogen only or that no hormone replacement at all. And you can see that taking hormones in this case with estrogen, no effect at all. The risks are the same. But if you add back progesterone as well as estrogen, then the risks um, of breast cancer are higher. And that's true in general, and that's true in premenopausal women who've had their ovaries removed when they were still active. This is in one study. It is concerning. It is part of the motivation for thinking about having the, ovary, the uterus removed as well, because if you have a uterus, you uh, cannot have estrogen, um, estrogen only hormone replacement if you have to protect the uterus from um, the unopposed estrogen and the increased risk of uterine cancer, which you would not want. Um, but it, would, it raises the question of whether the uterus should be removed to protect breast tissue. Now, if you're going to have mastectomies, that's not an issue, and hormone replacement can be anything. This, however, is not a confirmed study, so we need another study to show us that this is actually the important, uh, an important consideration, but it's concerning. Uh, it's this Dr. Nayrod's data and we always pay attention to that. Um, so what about this issue of should you take the, have a hysterectomy? You can see here that the serous carcinomas in the uterus, which look like the serous carcinomas of the ovary, they look like ovarian cancer. In this study, they were excessive statistically significantly with an increased risk of this cancer of 15%, but this is based on a grand total of five cases. And if you look down here, it's not at all in BRCA2 it's all in BRCA1 where the excess risk was 20 fold. So this discussion has, this has become part of discussion again, clearly a rare problem, clearly a, a problem that is more likely in BRCA1 than two, but quite rare and so rare that many surgeons do not feel that it's indicated. But women who might consider, for example, taking estrogen only hormone replacement if they didn't have a uterus, this might be part of how they uh, think about managing their risk of gynecologic malignancy. What else have we got coming up? So here, just quickly, we've got a trial, two trials now, um, trying to look at this issue of, can you just take the tubes and delay taking the ovaries? The WISP study, which is uh, looking for funding for a second version, and the SOROC study through the NRG. So this is a, a both of these studies are not randomized, they are prospective studies where women will have their fallopian tubes removed and then be followed. So at least we can learn whether this is enough. Can we, is it okay to delay taking the ovaries for a while, even though it's the ovarian risk that you're most concerned about? What about prevention approaches other than surgery in breast cancer? So this is speaking of the rank ligand blockade. So this is work from Dr. Lindemann in Australia, where he showed that this particular molecule, rank ligand, was really important in the development of breast cancers in BRCA1 carriers. This is unexpected finding. It just shows you how basic research is also important because the rank ligand is dependent on progesterone, a female hormone, and yet the tumors, when they develop, are hormone independent, triple negative. Um, in the mice, he showed that, uh, that if you block rank ligand, you could block proliferation. Here they are. This is TP53. This is the rank ligand and the proliferation that is gone here. Um, and here in the mice, you can show that if they take a inhibitor of rank ligand, that they delay development of tumor. In the mice, they never quite stop. Um, and this has led to an international study, BRCAP, randomizing healthy women 
who have their breast tissue and are not planning a prophylactic mastectomy soon um, with either denosumab, which is a drug used to treat osteoporosis, but is a rank ligand inhibitor against placebo. Denosumab is given as an injection under the skin every six months. So it's not a pill every day. It's, it's something that, but that you have to go and get. This is an international study. It's being run from the Austrian group, Dr. Singer, but it's also happening in the US at uh, 30 different sites. And the it's, not, it's not quite yet happening. It's going to be happening, hoping, hopefully opening in October. Um, I can't tell you that there was any intent of avoiding either the South or the North. These were the people who volunteered to have the study, but that may change over the course of the trial. If you live in an area where this trial will be open, we hope you will be interested in considering it. Um, what else is, is possible? So here is just a, not entirely pie in the sky, but something we all hope can happen. This is just showing lots of genes whose names you either do recognize or will recognize after you have been at this conference. In addition to BRCA1 and BRCA2, these are all part of DNA repair, which turns out to be the most important function of BRCA1 and 2, fixing errors in the DNA um, as cells go forward um, and making sure that they happen correctly. And there, here's BRCA2. And there's a whole network of pathways of other genes that are part of that. Um, these are the data on PARP inhibitors. So PARP inhibitors have had a lot of attention. This is in ovarian cancer where you can show huge effects. You don't have to be an oncologist to appreciate how far apart these curves are, um, where giving a PARP inhibitor improves outcome, and they have certainly made a difference in ovarian cancer. Here's the most recent trial in breast cancer called the Olympia trial. Complicated slide, but it basically compared the addition of Olaparib, a PARP inhibitor, to a placebo after all of standard breast cancer treatment was done. If people took the drug for a year and what was shown was that they were, whoops, less likely to, uh, they, their survival without breast cancer was much better. Um, and in fact, in this study, they, they, had to, they had less recurrence. The study has not yet shown that they live longer. It hasn't been followed that long. It did show that they did not have significantly different side effects from women who did not take the pill. And that has led people to think about whether PARP inhibitors themselves might be used to prevent or delay, maybe only delay cancers. However, they can't be taken every day. This was a study in mice where you can see that they were able to delay cancer development in the mice. So that's a beginning. Um, now we are discussing a study which will be using breast cancer as the endpoint, but hoping that we will be able to reduce risk of all cancers related to BRCA1 and 2, possibly by taking a drug, let's say a month, a year, where you could get rid of all those early cells becoming malignant, and then the rest of the year not take anything. Um, this is the design of the study with several different, trying to find the lowest possible level of drug you should take versus none, um, and following this. this is actually not a Comic grant, this is a DOD grant. So I've gone very quickly through a lot of data, uh, to, have, to remind us all that women who carry, uh, women in particular, but men and women who carry a BRCA1 or 2 um, pathogenic variant, so-called mutation, have a lot of decisions to make. But the good news is that there's 20 years of data to help us do it now. And we're much better equipped to estimate risks and to talk about the benefits of screening, of surgery, of uh, hormone replacement, of different options than ever before. That said, we are still not able uh, to individualize risk very well. We're good at giving the general numbers, but we're not doing so well in advising women individually about their risks or helping them always to make the best choices for themselves, although that is certainly our goal. And every year we hope that we will get better and better at this. Um, and I hope uh, that you will remain part of the group that helps us to improve.